Right, okay, the third lecture on analytical methods. Now, we've covered a few here, and we'll cover a few more in this one, but we haven't covered by any means the huge range of analytical methods that are available in food. Um, lots of good textbooks, lots of good resources on, on this. Okay, so we're not going to have a look at ICPMS here because we've already covered it in a previous lecture. We'll have a brief look at mass spec and GCMS and an even briefer look at other methods. Okay, mass spectroscopy, MS, sometimes called mass spectrometry. Uh, mass spectroscopy is a useful tool. Uh, it works by basically measuring the mass to charge ratio, the so-called M to Z ratio of molecules pres present in a sample. Uh, it can be used to calculate the exact molecular weight of the various components as well. Not always, but it can be useful when it does. Uh, and it can be used typically to identify unknown compounds by uh, determinations of their fragmentation patterns and determine structure and chemical properties of mo molecules. So here's a video which will take you through the basic pr principles, which I'll review a little bit in some of the forthcoming slides. And there's an image of the uh, a typical mass spectrometer design. Uh, this is the main stage of the process. Again, for further reading, see the LearnSci resource on MS in Blackboard learning materials. Okay, so this is how it works. The first stage is injection heating. Uh, as shown here, MS is often used in the GCMS system, where the GC stage is used to separate molecules in a mixture, with the MS performing qualitative analysis. The first stage after GC is vaporization, that is conversion of the gas phase by heating. Then an electron beam bombards the vapors, which converts some ions by removing electron to produce a positive ion. This is true even of things you would normally not expect to form positive ions, chlorine for example, in the notes it said negative ions, so that's a mistake, or never form ions at all, argon for example. Um, ionization and fragmentation. Molecules are broken down into positively charged fragments. This happens in characteristic ways depending on the structure of the molecule. And these fragments are def defined by the mass charge ratio, M to Z, which we've already talked about, which is what the instrument detects. Uh, this can be quite difficult, and ultimately the pattern, pattern is compared to libraries of related com com compounds, often done using expert systems to make judgments, help us make judgments. As mentioned, this is qualitative analysis. It only tells us what molecules are present. GC is a quantitative method, of course. Um, so this is a characteristic breakdown pattern of a hydrocarbon. Uh, it starts off in the uncharged form, it gets ionised, producing successive fragments which are positively charged. Note that each stage of the fragmentation, a CH2 group is lost, each with a mass of 14. Hence going from, for example, at the end, for end stage 43 to 29. Um, this is the mass spectrum of a hydrocarbon. It's very characteristic and clearly shows a fragmentation pattern. Um, okay, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Go back one. Uh, the molecular iron, which is tucked away down here, down here, is the molecule is the state where the molecule is only washed one electron and is not fragmented. This can be very useful for identification because it's essentially the same as the relative molar mass. But many molecules don't generate a molecular ion in mass spectroscopy. Um, okay, so the fragments, the ions, are deflected by a magnetic field according to their masses. The lighter they are, the more they are deflected. The amount of deflection also depends on the amount of positive charges in the ions. In other words, how many electrons were knocked off in the first stage? What we saw earlier on was just single electrons being knocked off, but sometimes more than one can be. Which has some complications. Uh, so to summarise, the more the ion is charged, the more it gets deflected. Uh, several types of detector available for mass spectrometers. The detector used for most routine experiments is the electron multiplier. An electron multiplier takes a small signal and amplifies it electro electronically. Uh, note that many samples are collected in a very short, short time, so this does promote more accuracy in measurement than you might think. Another type of detector is photographic plates coated with a silver bromide emulsion, which is sensitive to energetic ions. When I was a student, this is what we used to use. Uh, we used to get a long film of what was called UV, UV photographic paper, which we had to measure the uh, positions of the peaks by hand. And we had to do it very quickly because it faded uh, in about a couple of hours. The, the image was, was gone. Uh, things are much better these days. 
Okay, so this is a typical modern result. On the left, a range of possible compounds is, is suggested by the library. Um, it, it is often required to have a good knowledge of the chemistry involved to predict the to pick out what the correct chemical compound is. Okay, gas chromatography. Uh, gas chromatography, sometimes called gas liquid chromatography, is a powerful tool in analysis. It involves a sample being vaporized and injected at the head of a chromatographic column. The sample is transported through the column by the flow of inert gaseous mobile phase. Uh, the column itself contains a liquid stationary phase which is adsorbed under the surface of an inert solid. Remember our discussion of adsorption versus absorption in previous lecture. Uh, if you're interested and you want to know more, see this video for a good review of the process. This is a schematic of the system. Uh, the carrier gas I mentioned must be chemically inert. Commonly, commonly used gases include nitrogen, helium, argon and carbon dioxide. Uh, the choice of carrier gas is often independent upon the type of detector which is used. The carrier gas system also often contains a molecular sieve to remove water and other impurities. Uh, now a molecular sieve is a molecule, um, a material rather, with pores of uniform size. These pore, pore diameters are similar to small molecules which will pass through, but prevents larger molecules passing through, while smaller molecules can. There's, this, there, there's the guts of the system. The sample injector, the column, and some the column oven, and some detector. Uh, the column oven is important, and we'll come back to that in a second. But we'll talk about the column first. Uh, basically, there are two main types of columns for GC. Uh, there are so-called pack columns, which are characterised by their robustness and higher capacity. Uh, capillary columns, however, are used in most applications these days because of their high separation efficiency. Uh, capillary columns, often sometimes called open tubular columns, usually consist of fused silica, quartz, silicon dioxide. Capillary is coated with a polyimide layer. The polyimide layer provides the capillary with flexibility and stability, as well as giving it its characteristic brown colour. Uh, pack columns are short, thick columns made of glass or stainless steel tubes and have been used since the early stages of gas chromatography. I've certainly packed these by hand back in the day. Um, pack columns use broad shapes, broad peak shapes, and have low separation performance, but they can handle large sample volumes and are not susceptible to contamination, or less so than uh, the capillary columns. They're still used today in many official analytical methods and also for methods which analyse gases. Okay, back to temperature. Uh, GC separates mixtures on the basis of the boiling points of the components. In some cases, the analy analysis is isothermal, that is, done at temp constant temperature, but often, though, a thermal gradient is used, especially with components of significantly different boiling points. Um, as an example of one here, standing off at 40 degrees, then ramp standing off at uh, yeah, 40 degrees, then ramping up up to about 270 degrees. Uh, staying at that temperature for a level and then going to a high temperature above 13 degrees to bake off any remaining material on the column. Um, this mode of operation offers several advantages such as improvement of peak, sh peak shapes, improvement of resolution and completion of analysis in the fraction of the time it would take for isothermal operation. You need, probably need a very long column as well for that. Um, so this is a typical GC chromatogram. I'm uh, not sure here is the x-axis, which is for detector response, which depends on the type of detector you're using. Uh, peak may be identified by mass spectroscopy, as we've discussed a bit earlier, or by the use of standards, when you, particularly when you're using a standalone GC system. So similarly to HPLC there. We'll notice in this case the x-axis axis is in temperature. Okay, uh, linked together. Uh, as noticed, GC is often used in tandem with MS. Uh, there is, for further reading on GC, there is a resource in LearnSci, again, a blackboard learning materials. Uh, well worth having a look at. Okay, lots of other methods, which we're going to cover in one slide. Uh, too many to discuss here. Uh, the methods we've talked about here, we'll look at in much more detail next year in various modules. Okay, so thanks for listening. That completes that.